Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Summer, I'm the curator here at the museum. Um, before we get started, everybody take a second to turn off or silence your cell phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as for announcements, we have a summer camp to go for sale, which is a scavenger hunt around the island. It's fun for both kids and adults, and it's $15 per copy. Um, please contact Fia for more information. She's the lady at the back, but her card is also at that table with the tablecloth. Um, as for upcoming programs, our July brown bag lunch on the 7th will be with Francis Flood, who will talk about the history of Yuli and the old Flood store. And then our July 3rd on 3rd on the 16th will be with Caitlin Hoff Mahoney from the Matheson Museum in Gainesville, who will talk about the Johns Committee in Florida. Also, if you have an evaluation sheet on or around you, please fill it out at the end of the program um, and then put it in that basket at the back. Um, that's it for announcements, but tonight we have Nick Dionis. Nick is a lifelong Amelia Island resident who served as commissioner for 16 years. Having grown up Having grown up in the boat building business on Amelia Island, he is a local historian and the last wood boat builder left. So everyone, please welcome Nick. I'll have your money after the, after the <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, gosh, uh, as a show of hands, I'm just curious. How many are just brand new to the island? Oh, nobody. Nobody. All right. How many were born here? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. How many have been here 10 years? Okay. 15. Okay. 20? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just curious. That's all I always like to ask. You know. Well, tonight we're going to talk about boat building on Amelia Island and the shrimping industry. And the best way to do that uh, is to just simply tell you about my family and their history. Um, Fernandina, Amelia Island was noted for boat building. And uh, at any at any given time back in the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, there was anywhere from four to ten trawlers being built at one time. And so tonight, what I thought we would do is you're going to learn how these boats were built. You're going to learn how they were put together. You're going to, you're going to learn a lot tonight. So when you leave here tonight, you can go to the, well, don't go to the lumber yard now. <laughs> uh, but when prices come down, you can build your own boat. So our little, our little red pointer doesn't show up on this, so we're going to use the old. I went to the Catholic school. I'm used to these. Uh, okay. So wooden boat building in Fernandina. And the best way to tell it about, my grandfather, Mike Tiliakos, arrived here from Kalyamus, Greece in 1912. He met my grandmother, who was from here, and they got married in 1914, and they lived above the Palace Saloon. They rented two rooms up there. And uh, so my grandmother is really my ties to America. Then my father arrived in 1941, that's dad, uh, from uh, Santorini. That's where our family still lives today. Mm -hmm. I've been to Greece four times, and I've never been to Santorini. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but the last time I was there was 1967, so Ooh. Uncle Sam didn't think I needed to go to Santorini <laughs> that <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Okay, here we go. This is Dad. Everybody wanted to know, well, how many men did it take to build a boat? This is Dad and his crew. Dad's on the left. And um, 
this was his boatyard, which is ex was exactly where the container crane today is down at the huh. port. So if you see the first container crane, that's where his boat boatyard was. And the size of the building was big enough. This happens to be 68 feet with pilot house, and they built the boat indoors, inside. Mm. This is uh, Dad and I. That's my first boat. Yeah. I've tried to get this photo out, but uh, I can't remember her name, the, the lady here at the museum that put it in and told me I could never take it out. So anyway, I'm stuck. Did that boat slow? Sir? Would it slow? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what good is a boat if it doesn't float? <laughs> okay, here we go. Now we're going to learn how to build a boat. Laying the keel. These keels were southern yellow pine. And they were around 14 inches by 18 to 22 inches deep. So it was one tree. People ask all the time, how long was the keel? The formula for the keel is take the length of the boat that you're building, subtract 14 feet, and that's the size of the keel, length of the keel that you need. Why? Because on the stern, you got seven, and on the bow, you got seven. So here's the keel. This is starting the uh, shaft log, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. Here's a brand new boat under construction. This is a new boat that was just finished, and it's getting ready to be launched. So this is, you can kind of see how things would go at the boat yard. Um, here's the keel. This is the working on the shaft log. Um, there's Dad. Okay, so you've got the keel, the shaft log, there's the hole where the shaft comes out. The propeller would be right here. This is called the horn timber. These little holes that you see is where the ribs go. Hmm. The ribs were full two and a quarter by four and a quarter. Tennessee red oak. Uh, this is pine, this is pine, this is pine. Uh, let's move on. Now, this is, you can see right here, you see the hole for the shaft? There's your shaft log. This is the keel laying down. This is the bow stem. So the keel and the bow stem is laying on its side. But I want to bring your attention to something. This building, this was my grandfather's boatyard, which I'll show you how close in proximity we are to where it used to be in just a few moments. Here's a 65 foot boat. Here's a 65 foot getting ready to go under. So these two boats were in this one building. Had another building here attached to it where they would keep lumber. And you can see right here, here's another shaft log, another keel. Mm. Now, <clears throat> remember the horn timber we talked about? Mm -hmm. That held the stern. So these, the, uh, the backing for the stern, this is all oak. This is cypress. Mm. You know where the Marina Restaurant is downtown? Everybody yeah. know where the Marina Restaurant is? There it is. <laughs> so this gives you an idea of how close this boatyard, my grandfather's boatyard, was to Center Street. And then if you could look a little further, you would see where the container cranes are. That's where my dad's boatyard huh. was. Okay. Look at how neat everything was. <laughs> <laughs> I would be proud. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here's the stern going into place. It's quite an operation. Now, people wanted to know, well, how do you get the design? How do you know how much flare? How do you know, you know, what is it? You start with a half model. You all familiar with a half model? Mm -hmm. um, you start with a half model. And that half model is your boat. So make no mistakes on the half model, because that's what you're going to end up with. So you take the half model, and from that, 
you make your frames. So these are frames. This is the first frame, second frame, third frame, fourth frame, fifth frame, sixth frame, and then the stern. The stern is actually your last frame. So you put these on, and now you can start, You once you start putting your, your uh, we just call them uh, light stiffeners, you'll see in a moment, then you can really start seeing the shape of the boat. Yeah, I call this an ocean nightmare. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about it. We have any engineers in here? Oh, good. Great. Um, nothing against engineers. Um, can you imagine today if OSHA were to walk up to an operation and see something like this? I mean, look at the scaffolding. It's just got, you know, just boards under it, holding it up. Uh, there's dad. Where's dad? There's dad right there. There's my grandfather. <laughs> now, in the early 50s, this is the way it looked. Actually, late 40s. This was his boatyard where you saw the two boats going in. This was another building that he had that he, uh, this was actually a machine shop. They made their rudders, they made their tanks, they made fuel tanks, water tanks, uh, things like that. <laughs> a lot of people lived on houseboats back then. Mm -hmm. uh, this right here, this is a houseboat that Mr. and Miss Lovell lived on. Hmm. But I want to draw your attention to something. You see this little alcove? Mm -hmm. That's the bathroom. <laughs> and you don't see any plumbing. We'll leave that. Just leave that there. Now you want to know how close this boatyard was to where we are. You see this building? That's where we are right now. So this was if you took Beach Street, which is right over here. Beach Street used to go over the railroad tracks to Front Street. And that would go right into my grandfather's boat yard. <coughs> this is Bo, my dog. <coughs> I, I got to tell you a little boat yard story. Do we have any cat lovers in here? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm speaking just to the cat lovers. <laughs> I want you to understand something. I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I would never do what I'm getting ready to tell you today. Okay? We, we're good with that? My grandfather bought me Bo. Big Bulldog. And they wouldn't let me have Bo because they were afraid Bo would bite me. So one day at the beach my grandfather and grandmother lived on North Fletcher. They heard the dog screaming because that was the only time I could play with the dog was when I went to their house. And I had bit the tip of his ear off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they figured if the dog didn't bite me for biting the tip of his ear off, I could have the dog. So from that day on, Bo and I were inseparable. <laughs> well, one day, <clears throat> now there were feral cats everywhere at the boat yards. I mean, you can just imagine. So one day we found a litter of kittens. Oh, no. I told you I was young. <laughs> Well, Bo and I took the cats to the fish house, and on the other side of the fish house, we laid on the dock, and Bo had his paws over the edge of the dock, and I was laying, and we'd take a cat and drop it and watch the tide take it out. I told you I was young. <laughs> oh my God. Well, my uncle came down the dock and saw what we were doing, and he had what looked like a tuba set that he was getting ready to beat me with. When Bo jumped up, and between Uncle Johnny and I, it was nothing but teeth and slop. <laughs> Uncle Johnny backed off, put the board down, went back down the dock, went back to the boat yard. And I thought, I've got it made. I'm never going to get another whipping as long as I live. <laughs> About three hours later, the cats were all gone. Uncle Johnny, I'd already forgot about it. Uncle Johnny 
opens a can of dog food. <laughs> and he goes in the tool room. And Bo follows him. He puts the dog food on a piece of plywood, turns around, walks out, closes it, puts the, the, the lock on the hasp, and tore me up. <laughs> the moral to the story is dogs are man's best friend <laughs> until a can of dog food's involved. Wow. But that's both. Now we're talking about the ribs. Remember the in the horn temper, we were talking about the notches for the ribs. Well, here are the ribs going in. And here they are all bent and going in. Well, people want to know, well, how did you bend the ribs? You see this mold right here? Well, this mold is the mold for the, the center uh, uh, mold that we have for the boat. You see this pot? This pot was 30 feet long. These came anywhere from 20 to 28 feet in length, this oak. We put it in this pot and we boiled it for eight to 10 hours. The formula that we boiled them in was Tide soap powder. And do you remember Red Devil Lye? You used to get Red Devil Lye? we would pour a can of Red Devil lye in the water. When the ribs came out, they were just like a piece of wet spaghetti. And you would put them over this mold, tie them down. The next morning when you came, that's the, the shape that they retained. Hmm. They, they always had that shape. And they were as hard as a piece of steel. Hmm. What the Red Devil lye did, I don't know. Uh, what the Tide soap powder did, I don't know, but that was the formula. When Dad passed away in 69, we had four boats under construction. We finished those and then built, I think, three more. And then I closed the new building portion, but I still use the Red Devil Lie and the Tide soap powder. <clears throat> Here we are, bow stem. Now, with this light Steffner going in, you can see the shape of the boat as it starts taking shape around the ribs because this is where it is. This is actually the first plank being put on this boat right here. Again, everything's so neat. <laughs> this is the inside of the, the last boat that I built and this is what it looks like from center looking back. And it was always a, a pretty, here's your, here's your shaft log right here. This is where the, the shaft would go. You see the hole. Here's your horn temper, the stern, um, and the stiffener, the inner stiffeners aren't in yet. Uh, I think the next one, here we go. These are tuba 10s and tuba 12s doubled up. They're on top of each other and they're bolted on every rib. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, bolted on every rib. Now these are stiffeners to keep the boat from working this way, mm -hmm. from bow to stern. This holds everything together. Here's your keel, right here. Now we're beginning the planking. You can see the planking here. Um, you got your bow stem, you got everything, you know, it just, you just, th this boat has the deck already on it. And it didn't matter, you could put the deck on before, or you could put the deck on after. Uh, I always preferred putting the deck on first because you, now you've got a place to put things, in, you know, mm -hmm. at night. Uh, here's one uh, under construction. This is my two brothers. Um, and people wanted to know, well, why didn't you start at the bottom and plank up? Well, if you're building a boat outdoors and you start at the bottom, all you're doing is building a bathtub. I mean, because when it rains, it's going to hold water. So you want the water to go out. So the, when you're building outdoors, the first thing you want to do is do your planking on the bottom at last. Beautiful planking. This was a uh, completely uh, keel dried cypress and it was you know it had a, a, a it had a smell of cheese to it when you would plane it 
huh. and each plank you would have to take a bevel on the previous plank on every rib and then transfer that bevel to the new plank going in <clears throat> and as you put that plank up and then you draw it up with wedges uh, that's where you get the water tightness and of course the cypress being as dry as it was it was like a sponge when it went overboard it swelled immediately there wouldn't be a teacup of water in these boats mm -hmm. when you would launch them hmm. Got one under construction here, one under construction here. You can't see, but there was another one under construction there. Hmm. Um, the There was no caulking. A lot of people wanted to know about caulking. There was no caulking the seams of the planking. The hmm. only thing we caulked was the butts, the butt joints, where the, the two planks went together. And we caulked around the stern, hmm. and we caulked along the garbage. Other than that, there was no call. Hmm. Hmm. This is an oh, this is showing you now the floor timbers. And each floor timber, you had to make a pattern for each floor timber. Hmm. But if you look, each floor timber is on top of a rib, not alongside a rib. Hmm. It was real easy. Uh, a lot of boat builders built them and they just laid them alongside the rib hmm. and it was easy to go and just scrap it take it to the bands all cut it bring it back and put it in but that's not helping the strength of the boat the strength of the boat is these floor timbers were on top of the ribs and they were bolted and even through the keel and then of course your engine beds we'll get to that in a minute were set here and your flooring would be here, your fuel tanks would be here. Mm. You know, you, you've all heard about the Dixie Queen that always won the shrimp boat races. We built the Dixie Queen and there she is before she was ever launched. Mm. Uh, she's waiting for high tide in this picture. Uh, to go over the uh, Here's a boat. Uh, this is just showing you the decking, uh, the stern, the decking, uh, the hatch in the back. Uh, this is where the pilot house is going to go. Okay. Oh, there we go. Now, here's the engine bed uh, right here. So the engine beds here, the engine would fit here. Uh, the, the, the shaft log is here, <coughs> horn timbers here. But I want to point, you remember the stiffeners we talked about? Mm -hmm. We also planked on the inside. So our planking was full engine seven eighths uh, cypress. And that's the same thing we used on the inside was engine seven eighths. And we actually drew it up tight, just like we did on the outside. And all that did was just give you more strength for the boat. A uh, little more work, but it was worth it in the long run. My two brothers again. That's all they did was stand in front of us. Uh, now this is looking forward. And you see these right here? These are natural oak knees. And Dad had a guy who would climb. He'd climb a tree. And uh, I can't remember his name. But he would climb a tree and, and run a chainsaw. Well, he always made me go to the woods with him. <laughs> Never quite understood it. But he would go and he would look up in the trees. And he would have me stand by the tree. <laughs> Well, it finally dawned on me years later, Dad was dead, he was using me as a measuring device. He knew exactly how tall I was, and he could take that, you know, look up there and tell if that's what he wanted or not, because these are natural. Uh -huh. And that's the only thing he would use was natural, in the bow and in the stern. So that was my... My game to flame. I, yes, sir. Did, did you make the same boat every time? Or no, sir. 
different plan, yes. you know, different sizes, lengths, and things like that? Yeah, you would you would go to the boatyard and talk to Dad or my grandfather or my uncle, and uh, you would tell them, they would ask you questions like, where are you going to fish? Are you going to fish in shallow water? Are you going to fish way offshore in deep water? Are you going to fish in Texas? Are you going to fish up in the Carolinas? What are you going to do? Because this told them what you needed, and then they would express to you what they what you needed. And if they didn't have a boat to fit what you wanted, they just simply went out and just did a new half model, and they did drafting and lofting, and they made new molds, and they just built your boat. Mm -hmm. But you know that's interesting. That brings up another one. All the years that we built boats, I never once remember a contract. Huh? Ever. <clears throat> it was just a handshake. And I never once remember dad being shorted any money. It was just a handshake. Today, <laughs> the attorneys would cost more than the boat. <laughs> we don't have any attorneys. <laughs> Got to be careful today. <laughs> How much did the boat sell for? Back then? Yeah. Back then in the 50s, they were running about a $600 a foot. And that was completely decked out ready to go. In the 60s, they were running about $1,200 a foot. And today, not enough money to build one. Right. You know, the pr people say, well, why, don't, why aren't they building more wood boats? Well, there's a few places that still build a few wood boats, but most of them today are steel hulls. And the reason for it is, is two. Number one, you can't get the material anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much money you have, you can't get good material. And secondly, there are no craftsmen left to do it. Nobody knows how to do a half model. I still build half models and I still draw plans. Mm -hmm. Simply because that's the way I was taught and I enjoy doing it. But <clears throat> nobody knows how to do that anymore. And uh, so you just don't have the craftsmen, you know, to do it. Um, did you have something called the Greek Notch? Yes, on the bow stem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was actually, it, the bow stem would come down and where it notched into the keel. Uh, when you got completely finished with it, you had about a three-quarter inch gap, and you would take two wedges and drive from both sides, and that locked everything into place. And that oh, it was not going anywhere. <laughs> I never known of one going anywhere. How long would these boats last? <clears throat> I'm going to show you something. <laughs> <laughs> now, those of you from here, you know Anna. Does anybody know Anna Tiliakis? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's Anna. That's my cousin. And people want to know, well, did you build anything other than shrimp boats? Yeah, we built motor yachts. Did we like it? No. <laughs> you know, it's too, I don't know. But this was the motor yacht that was built <coughs> at, at Uncle Johnny's boat yard. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't, I never liked working on those. Was that Dr. Wolf's? Is that what? Dr. Wolf had one built. No, this was a guy named, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Wolf did have one, but that's, that's not it. Mm -hmm. Dad got it. I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> As the 50s kept moving, the demand on shrimp kept getting bigger and bigger worldwide. And so the industry kept growing. And everybody wanted bigger boats, more power. They wanted to pull larger nets, and they wanted to pull, pull more nets. Instead of one net, let's pull two, let's pull three. In some cases, let's pull four. Well, you can only stretch a boat so far. You can only stretch a model so far. So Dad, <clears throat> he was not only a master boat builder, but he also was a marine architect, if you will. Uh, he drew new plans, and what he drew was dubbed the Super Trawler. And they still use this plan even to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So the, the industry was growing, uh, more power was going on these boats, bigger wheels. We'll get to that in just a minute, too. Uh, the Mr. Mike, this was named after my grandfather, and um, I think I have, uh, yes. This boat, um, this had one of the, the prettiest designs I think I've ever seen on a shrimp boat or a trawler. Mm -hmm. uh, but just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful boat. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was some of our boats. This was the grandchild, and this boat, uh, no, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. This was the Dungeness. Yeah. Well, you, you can remember the Dungeness. This is the Dungeness. Uh, here again, there's the Marina restaurant. Uh, this was the boat club house right here. Hmm. Um, this was the standard oil dock. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, let me back up one. Okay. This is the grandchild. And there I am. Now you've got to remember, I had a grandfather from the old country who came here with three dollars in his pocket and literally built an empire. Mm. I was not only the first grandchild, I was the only grandchild. Oh. The Queen of England was envious of me. <laughs> I could do no wrong in his eyes. And he ruled the family with an iron fist. So here I am, and they're building a boat, they're naming it after me, and I call myself working on it, and you know, they put it overboard and I would go out fishing on it. <laughs> we have the, the Mr. Mike and the Michael T. Uh, my uncles, we, my dad, he owned three boats, but my uncles owned, I think, 11 boats at one time. Mm. And they were everywhere. They were down in Key West. They were in Texas. They were in Tampa. Mm. Just all over. <clears throat> Now, the prop, the stern bearing, and the rudder, all of and the and the uh, shoot, rudder shoot, all of this had to be manufactured. You couldn't run into an Ace Hardware and say, "I need a rudder for a seventy foot boat." Well, how did you know how big to make the rudder? Well, it all comes from that half model. You know, so, could you explain a little bit more about the half model? I don't really know what that I is. I wish I had a, I, I got to put a picture of a half model in here. A half, you've seen in restaurants, you've seen these half boats up on the wall. Mm -hmm. That's a half model. So yes. you make it, yeah, you make your half model. Uh -huh. And this is the way your boat's going to look because you're going to take the, the dimensions off of this. And when you get through, you're going to have a huge mold to put on your boat, but that's the way it's going to look. So the half model is, it's important. I mean. So is it like three feet long? Oh, you can make them this long. You can make whatever, them just, just however long you want. Them. Yeah, because you're going to scale them out before you make your, your big molds to go in. The largest prop wheel that we ever put on was a five bladed prop and it went on the little archie. You remember the little archie? That was for Art Hagen we built, and the University of Georgia funded most of it. They put an experimental engine in it, and it was double ribbed. Remember I told you the ribs were four and a quarter by two and a quarter. This was doubled, another one on top of that one, <laughs> because it had so much power. But the wheel that she swung, she swung a 70-inch wheel, and uh, that was a lot of power in that boat. <laughs> And what they built the boat for was an experimental boat way offshore, just this side of the, the, the ditch. They heat drug for fish. And there's actually a uh, photograph of him as they caught these fish. They swelled up with air, their bladders. The whole rig floated. He was walking on the rig out in the middle of the ocean. I'm, I'm trying to get a, a copy of that photo from his son if I can ever tie his son down. Uh, but anyway, 
So, you know, we would order our, our props. And, and like I said, you had to take into consideration everything. How much water did the boat draw? Uh, you know, what size prop? How much horsepower is going to move it? What's the size of the shaft? So there was a lot that went into, you know, figuring out exactly what you needed. Now, someone asked about how long these boats last. I had a phone call last year from uh, Bunny Sterling. And Bunny was a local captain here. He's retired now. He says, uh, I got something you're not going to believe. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I just saw the Miss Hazel. I said, you're right. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> He says, no, I'm serious. He said, it's in Mayport. I said, no, come on, Bunny, it can't be. He said, no, it's the Miss Hazel. Well, about three weeks later, I had to go to Beach Boulevard, and my wife was with me, and it was raining, and I wasn't going to hit 95 and 9A at 4.30, 4, 4.45 in the <laughs> afternoon. So we just went on down and came through Mayport. Well, as I passed the first fish house, something caught my eye. And I went down, stopped, turned around, and came back. I got out in the pouring rain, and there she was. <laughs> I met the two young guys that own it, and they're fishing the boat. Now, they were doing some repair work to it. And um, so anyway... It uh, wasn't long after that, and I think I have some pictures When was it built? 1954. Jeez. Whoa. Yeah, and it's still fishing today in Maple. Yeah. Uh, I was coming back, and the, the dry dock over by the ferry, yeah. I just happened to see the name. I stopped, drove my car in, and took some photos of it. This boat's in excellent condition. I mean, she's in, and they told me, they said, the only thing that's been done, we changed the engine. They had a 671 Gray Marine in it, and they ended up putting, uh, I think, a GM, six-cylinder GM in it. But it's in great shape. I mean, you know, I, I was so pleased to be able to see it on dry dock because I saw Dad everywhere on it, you know. Yeah. People want to know that we still build boats. Kind of. <laughs> uh, only for select owners. Um, the last boat I built <coughs> was this one. <laughs> <laughs> and the owner about drove me crazy. <laughs> now this boat is 10 foot long. And I said, okay, if we're going to build a boat, then let's do a half model and let's really loft and draft it so he could see how it was done. Now, you've, all of you have seen pond boats that you put in the pond. And when an adult or two adults get in, you got about that much free board. You know what I'm talking about? The water's down to about here. So this owner who kept driving me crazy every day. Uh, we finally got the boat built. And there's the owner. That's launch day, and that's my great-grandson, Brady. And uh, so we're getting ready to launch the boat. Now, here's Papu. This is his engine. This is my son. Here's Braden. But I want to draw your attention to something. You see how much water this boat's drawing? Yeah. There's a one half inch piece going along the bottom. You can see it right there. Uh -huh. This boat's not drawing one inch of water. Oh, wow. And it all boils down to your design. You design it right and you won't have anything to worry about. <laughs> but so many people will just put a boat together and they don't take into consideration the weight that's going in and what they're going to do with it. Same thing here. I mean, you can see there's hardly, it's not drawing anything. <clears throat> and here's Dad. Uh, this is, he's looking inside the pilot house, and this is the boat that was being built outdoors. And, uh, but everything had to be made. You couldn't go order windows. You had to make your windows. You had to make the frames. And this was uh, planked here, and the window would come up and go down into the into this, and then 
that's the way you would lock it in. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Did you also set the rigging? No. We had a machine shop, my uncle did, and while the boat's being built, uh, the outriggers were being built, the uh, mast was being built, the boom was being built, the, all the cables were being made and put in place. And uh, usually the engine was put in place sometimes before we launched it, but sometimes after we launched it. So it just depended upon the owner uh, if he could get the engine in time, you know, to put it in while it was on, you know, before it was launched. So no, all of that had to be made, and just like your fuel tanks, we had to make patterns down in the engine room for fuel tanks. And so they would take and send those patterns to the machine shop, and they would build the tanks, you know, for that. Yeah. Yes, sir. When your grandfather came over, what did he do before he came over, and what kind of education and training did y'all have? My grandfather, who came from Columos, uh he, I don't think they had anything like high school, you know, back then, uh, but he was taught uh, boat repair from some of his family. My dad, from Santorini, started working at the boat yard when he was like nine years old, and he learned... Mm -hmm. First, uh, he learned uh, drafting and lofting and uh, the the architectural end of it. And then he started at the boat shop. Trained in that? In your family? Or yeah, family. family. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, family. It was just handed down. And so they brought that over here, and that's that's how it all got started. How about you? What, what training did you do that? Uh, a stick bigger than this. <laughs> uh, when school got out at three, you had best better be at that boat yard no later than three fifteen. Uh -huh. I mean seriously, and you worked. They didn't knock off at five, and you worked till sun went down. And uh, you worked every weekend at the boat yard. I mean, if I wanted to, oh, there was no pay. But if you wanted to make some money, you did it at night time. Uh, I'd work at a filling station or something. You know where the golf carts are on 8th Street? Mm -hmm. Well, that used to be the Sunoco station. Huh. A guy named Ray Carter owned it, and I worked for him at nighttime and picked up some money there. And then where Fred's used to be, that was Win Dixie. Yep. And then <clears throat> we uh, there were several of us. They would lock us in at nighttime, and we'd put up stock. <laughs> and... Uh, so uh, that's how we made our money. But no, it was just, it, you were just taught. I mean, from the time, from the time you were big enough to sweep the floor, uh, you were just taught, this is how you do it, you know. Um, are there any of your boats that are still around? Where the last boat that we launched is the jet stream here. Uh, she's still fishing out of here, I think, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who owns that boat now? Trap. Trap. Oh, Harris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd like to go see it sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Don't look like a <laughs> oh no. Oh oh I know. I, I I went by it the other day. I thought, oh, that's a piece going to waste. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. So how many shrimp boats did your family build and were there other people in the area also building shrimp boats? No, we were the only two families building boats. Now the Burbanks were building nets. The Freeman, Red Freeman, was building nets. But as far as boat building, then the only other boat builder close to us was Harry Snyder's and his son, Nicky, down in St. Augustine, which we were good friends with. Uh, Nicky, I think, is still alive. He is. He is? I need to go see him. Yes, ma'am. Who built the boats that were over by the, where the bridge is? Oh, that was uh, Mr. Sparkman. He built those, yeah. He uh, that he was a neat, neat guy. He just enjoyed building a boat. The problem was he took so long, it was rotten by the time he got ready. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he would come to the boatyard and get advice, and Dad would go help him, you know. Then there was a... 
there, the marina used to be called Russell's, Russell's Restaurant. And a guy named Russell Kirkland owned it. And uh, they lived in New Berlin. And he wanted to build a boat, but he wanted to build it over in New Berlin because he lived right on a, a creek. So every weekend we would get in our Nash Rambler and I was a little fella and we'd go to uh, New Berlin and dad was building the boat. Well, they named the boat the Silver Mist. They got the boat all finished, got it in the water, got the engine in, got all the rigging on it. And he hired a captain and the first morning that they went out to fish, uh, he took a left, headed to Georgia just a little too quick, went on the rocks, and that was the end of it. Oh, no. And the big thing was, oops, I forgot to get insurance. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> True story. Yes, uh, on the worms, I mean, does the cedar planking, you didn't have to worry about the worms? You know, yeah, you always worried about the, the worms, the Torito worms. I mean, I've seen boats... It looked like a, a, a colander, you know, just holes everywhere. But uh, Cliff Littles, you remember Cliff Littles? Mm, well, we built a Miss Nina Joe for Cliff. And Cliff, uh, down at the boat yard one day, he uh, and the owners would come. They would work on their own boats if they wanted to. You know, Dad would say, okay, it's time to paint the bottom. Cliff had a bucket of coal tar. And he mixed mineral spirits with the coal tar. And he put his roller in there and he was putting this stuff on that beautiful cypress. <laughs> and he said, nope. He says, I'm not going to worry with worms. <laughs> well, 30 years later, there had never been a worm on that boat. Hmm. But paint wouldn't stick to it either. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah. we all learned a lesson from well, that. You can explain to the crowd, we didn't have to paint them up until the 70s or 80s until Rainier quit talking. Yeah, uh, he's, he's right about that. It used to, the river used to be so polluted, uh, mm -hmm. if you got in your boat and you ran in front of Rainier, <laughs> the water red. turned red. Oh. And it was like steam coming off of the water, but it wasn't steam, it was acid. This is true. Oh and little fish with their nose stuck out were swimming round and round. Oh. Uh, you, never you, had prayed. Change, you never had to change the pile on Oh, yeah, the there was no barnacles. As soon as, they, as soon as they quit dumping two years, you had to start. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you ever build a sailboat, and were there other boat builders who were sailboat builders? Not here. Not we here. built sailboats. Oh, you did? Yeah, there was a, uh, the last sailboat that Dad built was for Tommy Hall. And you remember Tommy? Mm -hmm. Young Tommy. Well, this is for his dad. And uh, it was 30, I think 38 feet in length. And uh, it was in December. Mm -hmm. And there was a house next door to the boat yard, and they were burning uh cardboard in a wood stove and the embers were going out and got into the boat yard and oh. set it on fire. Oh. Oh. Well dad had insurance as long as there was a boat under construction 40 feet or longer. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so there you go. Yes sir. Was there any relation uh, between your grandfather coming here and uh, folks that went to uh, Tarpon Springs? My grandfather actually was on his way to Tarpon Springs ah. in 1912. And I really never found out what brought him here. I don't know, but he was on his way to work on sponge boats yeah. down in Tarpon. Uh -huh. Yeah, now my dad wanted to get out of Greece and the war was starting and so in 1941 he became first officer with the Greek merchant marines and he told them he said I'm here for one cruise I just want to make it to the states and back then that was okay so he made it to the states he and five other uh, Greeks and they were all carpenters dad was a boat builder and the other four were carpenters well, through an attorney in in New York, my grandfather found out about these five, and he sent for them, and they came to Fernandina. That's how my dad ended up here. 
I have a letter from the uh, the ship that he was on, and uh, it said, if you get torpedoed, no, but it's true, it's in my office, if you get torpedoed, the company will, if you live, the company will reimburse you $100 for your, for your possessions. Yeah. I mean, it was wartime, I mean, it was bad. Yes, sir. I like that money involved in boats, since you per foot or some kind of a number for what it costs to build a boat. Uh -oh. What's happened? You'd spend today, well, forget a wood hull, but even a steel hull, you probably half a million. Oh, easy, yeah. easy, half a million. Mm -hmm. 600, 700,000, I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe even a million. I bet he slabs over. My grandmother had a phrase, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Juice ain't worth the squeeze. Yeah. Okay. Now you can go to, um, where was it they were telling me that uh, the, uh, government had repossessed a bunch of shrimp boats and you could go buy them for pennies on the dollar. Huh. I don't even want one of those deals. <laughs> yeah. But I will tell you this, ocean caught shrimp, that's the best. Oh uh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Did you use the same technique on the cypress planking for the the bended forming? No. 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 That that, that cypress was so dry. And so beautiful. I mean, that's the only way I know to describe it. Uh, my wife, we got married in 67. She used to come down to the boat yard and we would have the, you know, from the planer. The, the, she would, you know, put them all in her hair. You know. <laughs> but the smell was just, it was heavenly. You know, the smell of that cypress. But you would put it on and then you could actually bend that one and seven eighths inch of uh, six inches, eight inches, ten inches wide long, around, and then you would, start, you would, oh yeah, yeah, beautiful, no knots, no wind shakes, yeah. and you would start clamping it and bringing it in place. Mm -hmm. And of course, the top is plain to meet every angle on every rib of that plane. So when you drew it up tight, it was tight. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, uh, I've enjoyed this, and let me see. <clears throat> Amelia Island TV, I have to plug it. Uh, because I'm just so passionate about history. That's why I want to keep the boat building history alive and doing things like this for the museum. Uh, but um, if you want to take a, I don't know how you do this. Uh, <laughs> I could get my great grandson here. Uh, but anyway, if you want to keep up with the history that's going on with Amelia Island TV, just take a picture of that. But if you have no more questions, I thoroughly enjoy. Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Hold on. Nick, what are you doing now? Tell us about this project. Well, I met this gentleman, uh, Chris Yarborough, uh, about a little over two years ago, and he uh, he is a videographer, and he owns his own video company. And uh, I met him because I was chairman of the Tourist Development Council, and when I was a county commissioner, and today I sit on the board of directors for the CBB. And they called me and said, you know, we're doing, would you mind talking in front of the camera about tourism? And I said, sure. So that's when I met Chris and we just hit it off. So I was doing um, a series, I have 21 on YouTube, and it's called Amelia Island Footprints. And it's the history of what Amelia Island downtown Fernandina was like in the uh, early 50s and 60s with interviews and photographs. So if you have time, go look up Amelia Island Footprints. But I quit doing those because I started working with Chris and we're doing the history thing. We're getting ready to do a, a big documentary on Fernandina. So that, so if you want to just scan that, however you do it, you'll be on an a email list. And no, he does not sell email <laughs> or anything like that. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Nick, and thank you all for coming. Um, if you have an evaluation, please fill it out.
And stay dry it sounds like a train. <laughs> 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 So good. Oh my God. So good. Yeah.